Hi, these are the top 20 films of 1997. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. 1997 was a great year for cinema, so there's going to be loads of movies I left off, so please include your favourites down below. And if you like these videos, consider giving this a like and subscribing. Cheers. In at number 20, The Fifth Element. Bruce Willis is back, this time in an orange vest. Luc Besson's sci-fi epic is marvellously fun and really, really silly. And by the way, there are a lot of silly films on this list. Bruce Willis plays a taxi driver in the future who, after a strange woman falls into his cab, is thrown into a quest to find some magic stones to save the world from destruction. Willis is his usual charming self. Mila Jovovich is the best she's ever been in her breakthrough role. Ian Holm is as always excellent. Chris Tucker nearly sinks the bloody thing with a headache-inducing performance. And Gary Oldman delivers another fantastic villain. The design of the film is brilliant from the clothes to the sets. The script might not make a whole load of sense, but that doesn't matter because you're having so much fun. We're sending somebody into the dossier! Anybody else want to negotiate? In a number 19, Hannah B. Outside of Takeshi's castle. Orson Cartier, shock it. This is my favorite Takeshi Kitano project. Like so many of Kitano's films, this is somber, violent, and strangely moving. Kitano plays a cop who leaves the force and borrows money from the mob to spend more time with his dying wife. What could go wrong? Kitano is brilliant as usual in his very quiet way. It's slow, poetic, bizarre and totally unique. It isn't as funny as Takeshi's Castle, but then few things are. Oh. Oh, ow. Oh, I'm lucky. What a wobbly wazzock. In at number 18, Air Force One. Another very silly film, and not the last silly film on this list to take place on a plane. In the 1990s, there were so many Die Hard on a Blank rip-offs. Die Hard on a bus, Die Hard on a boat, but Die Hard on Air Force One with the president being the action hero has to be the silliest idea. How do you pull off such a moronic plot? Well, have Wolfgang Peterson direct it and have Harrison Ford play the commander-in-chief. Ford is brilliant at looking simultaneously vulnerable and capable. You can't help but root for him. And we get another wonderful Gary Oldman villain, here playing a Russian who seizes control of the plane. You said you were going to release us. Forgive me, I lied. The rest of the cast is filled with brilliant actors, including Glenn Close and William H. Macy. It's also got some truly terrible CGI, which a lot of the films on this list suffer from. But you can ignore that when there's great action, squibs, and plenty of fun dialogue. Get off my plane. In a number 17, Children of Heaven. Without a doubt, my favorite film about shoes. This is a wonderful Iranian film about a pair of siblings looking for a pair of lost shoes. And through two astonishing child performances, it gets us to care deeply for their quest. It has to be one of the best depictions of love and friendship between a brother and sister, and it ends with a nail-biting race. A simple story, powerfully told, with great filmmaking. In at number 16, Con Air. The last silly film on this list to take place on a plane, but not the last silly film on this list. This nonsense blockbuster is filled to the brim with stupid, over-the-top action, really dumb quips oh, oh man it smells like so much shit in your mouth you told me you loved me and a plethora of actors overacting but what actors you've got nicholas cage sporting a silly southern drawl and an even worse haircut i said put the bunny back in the box john malkovich as the criminal genius cyrus the virus as well as Ving Rhames, John Cusack, Dave Chappelle, Danny Trejo, and Steve Buscemi playing a strangely lovable mass murderer. The film takes place on yet another plane taken over by bad guys. This time, Con Air, a plane holding the worst of the worst criminals. 
Nicolas Cage is the wrong guy in the wrong place at the right time, as a former Marine set to be released after serving his time after accidentally killing a man in a fight. He's a very, very capable and dangerous man. It's so silly, but such a fun ride. You just stay here and don't panic. It's easy for you to say. You don't gotta take a piss. You know, number 15, Happy Together. Another beautiful, tragic romance from Wong Kar Wai. Here we get Tony Leung and the late, great Leslie Chung as an on and off again gay couple traveling across Argentina. As is so often the case with Wong Kar Wai, there isn't much of a plot. We just get snippets of these people's lives and it focuses on the passion and the heartbreak. Both men are tremendous in the picture, but it is once again Christopher Doyle's cinematography which is the real star. Having him capture South America is a real treat. Wong Kar Wai is one of the best storytellers to deal with the complex nature of relationships. And here he gets us to care sometimes without his characters even saying a word. In a number 14, Men in Black. There are three rules if you want to be a man in black. Rule number one, never tell anyone what you do. Rule number two, never press the red button. And rule number three, I'm going to. All jokes aside, Will Smith is perfectly cast in this sci-fi comedy action movie as a tough, joke-cracking New York cop recruited by a brilliantly gruff Tommy Lee Jones into a secret force to deal with aliens on Earth. It's really imaginative, really funny, has some great practical effects, some so-so CGI, and director Barry Sonnenfeld sets out to entertain, and boy oh boy does he. The two leads have great chemistry. Well, why, why the big secret? People are smart, they can handle it. The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. And joining them are some brilliant actors, including Linda Fiorentino, Tony Shalhoub, Rip Torn, a fantastic pug, and Vincent D'Onofrio on fine form playing a cockroach hiding in a man's skin. In a number 13, Gattaca, an incredibly stylish sci-fi film. The locations, sets and costumes are the real stars of this film. It looks so bloody cool, perfectly suiting the world these cold characters live in. We enter a future where the wealthy use eugenics to make their offspring have the best start in life. These genetically superior people, valids, get all the desirable careers, while those born the good old-fashioned way are relegated to menial jobs. Well, this doesn't suit Ethan Hawke's genetically inferior social climber. He does everything he can to pretend to be a valid even using DNA from a now disabled valid played brilliantly bitterly by Jude Law. He could be discovered at any time, and then when a murder happens, the tension rises even more. It has a great cast, including Alan Arkin, Ernest Borgnine, Uma Thurman, and even Gore Vidal. It's a smart sci-fi film that deals with plenty of interesting subjects. In number 12, Gross Point Blank. What a fun, very 90s movie. The ever-lovable John Cusack stars as a hitman who reluctantly goes to his high school reunion. A silly premise, expertly pulled off. The script is incredibly witty. Debbie, I'm in love with you. But I know we can make this relationship work. The action, surprisingly good. The soundtrack and score by The Clash's Joe Strummer is toe-tappingly good. And it has an outstanding cast, including Alan Arkin yet again, Joan Cusack, Jeremy Piven and Dan Aykroyd having a blast as a rival hitman wanting to start a union. Why don't you just join the union? We'll go upstairs together and cap daddy. This union, is there gonna be meetings? Of course. No meetings. National Security. Workers of the world, unite! In a number 11, Good Will Hunting. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck get most of the credit for this film, but I think this centers on the fantastic performance by Robin Williams. Affleck and Damon won the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, and Damon wrote himself a ridiculously good part. A working class, tough, handsome, secret genius. He is discovered by an MIT professor played by Williams. 
It is his mentorship and their relationship which makes this film so involving. The scenes where Williams talks about his late wife are incredibly touching. Williams has some amazing ad-libs that even get Matt Damon laughing hysterically. But these scenes are so moving as well. I don't regret the 18 years I was married to Nancy. I don't regret the six years I had to give up counseling when she got sick. And I don't regret the last years when she got really sick. And I sure as hell don't regret missing a damn game. That's regret. Here are some other notable releases of 1997. And let's get the big, 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 huge one out of the way. Yes, one of the most successful films of all time, The Full Monty. This British film about unemployed men in Sheffield becoming strippers was a massive hit. Also, Titanic was released. James Cameron's insanely successful film is a technical marvel, but the romantic story left me as cold as the Atlantic left DiCaprio. Some other major directors who released films in 1997 included Martin Scorsese made Kundun, a film about the Dalai Lama. I can't think of it though without thinking of Christopher Moltisanti and The Sopranos. Oh, Marty! Kundun! I liked it! Robert Zemeckis released Contact, David Lynch had Lost Highway, Barry Levinson directed Wag the Dog, Ang Lee had The Ice Storm, and Steven Spielberg tried to repeat the magic of 1993 with the Jurassic Park film and a more serious film with The Lost World and Amistad, two so-so films. For foreign cinema, you had Open Your Eyes before it was remade in America as Vanilla Sky, the original Insomnia by Eric Skjolbarg before it was remade by Christopher Nolan, the original Funny Games by Michael Haneke before it was remade by Michael Haneke, Pedro Almodovar made Live Flesh, there was the Iranian Taste of Cherry, and from Japan you had The End of Evangelion and the brilliantly disturbing Cure. And there was the beloved Holocaust comedy Life is Beautiful. It's not the way I would have dealt with that terrifying dark period in history, but it's hard not to cry while watching it. Other major motion pictures of the year included the disappointing fourth alien film Resurrection, the mildly entertaining second Pierce Brosnan Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies, the far more entertaining first Austin Powers film, Disney released Hercules with a stellar performance from James Woods as Hades, Demi Moore kept her clothes on but shaved her head in G.I. Jane. G.I. Jane 2, can't wait to see it, all right? In The Devil's Advocate, we got a chillingly subtle performance from Al Pacino as Satan. He's laughing his sick fucking ass off. He's a tight ass, he's a sadist. And with a lot of 1997 films, it had some atrocious CGI. Speaking of bad CGI, Spawn had some of the worst, although Roger Ebert seemed to enjoy it. With his visions of hell, which you didn't even mention, right. are truly worthy of a medieval artist or Hieronymus Bosch. The, the visions of wow. what hell looks like in this movie are things we've never seen before on screen. And right. that dragon-like character, the kind of overgrown gecko, as they yeah. call him, who was the, the beast of hell, yeah. that's a wonderful uh, animated and special effects Creation. It didn't and then, stand out for me. And then for some reason we got two Volcano Disaster movies, yes two, with Volcano and Dante's Peak. There were some really underrated films, such as Copland, In the Company of Men, Mouse Hunt, and the comedy The Man Who Knew Too Little. And can I see your driving license, sir? No, you may not! Other comedies of the year included Liar Liar, Chasing Amy, Waiting for Guffman, because when Ron had his surgery, all right, all right, all when right. Ron had his surgery, I said, hey, circumcise it while you're at it. You know, just because yeah, yeah. I've never been with anyone else. Right, Ron's well, the only is, man I've been with. Know, what what surgery uh, did he have? Nothing. Yeah, I had a so minor uh, penis reduction surgery. I'm sorry? Penis reduction, which said, there aren't many. You're going to say I never heard of that because there haven't been many reduction. cases. Oh. Yeah. I said, Ron, oh, no. do something. And he said, why don't you get one of those... Vagina enlargement. Oh, dear. Can we have some coffee over here? And Robin Williams played with living snot in Flubber. For horror films, you had... The Second Scream and a Scream rip-off, I Know What You Did Last Summer. There was the inventive Cube and the very fun Event Horizon. Exit Face. We're leaving. Not so good but very watchable was Anaconda with more terrible CGI. Speaking of bad films, there was the atrocious Spice World, 
American Werewolf in Paris. And there was the famously atrocious Batman and Robin. His name is Bane. A laundry service that delivers will pull Batman's heart from his body and feel it freeze in the hands. <sighs> We're leaving. Right, on to my top 10. In a number 10, Perfect Blue. One of the greatest animes of all time. Satoshi Kon's feature film debut is fantastic and deals with many themes he would deal with again, most notably the blurring of reality and fantasy, much as Terry Gilliam's films do. Here we get a story about a member of an idol group who leaves the music industry to focus on acting. But during this uncertain time in her career, she is also a victim of stalking by a particularly frightening villain. With all of this going on, she starts to lose her grip on reality, and we enter her paranoid mind and lose hours alongside her. Animation is the perfect format to mix dreams and reality. Here the filmmaker can show anything he can imagine, and we can't tell what is real for the character and what isn't. A brilliant film from a brilliant new artist. In a number nine, Donnie Brasco, where Johnny Depp plays a very, very obvious undercover cop. First of all, he starts it with a very suspicious moustache. <clears throat> that moustache. You gotta get rid of that moustache. And even when he shaves that, he still looks terrified throughout the movie, in a similar way to Leonardo DiCaprio in The Departed. We've got a rat, boys. Well, I assume it's that far too attractive man over there sweating buckets. That aside, this is a great crime film. It's not flashy, it doesn't glamorize the mafia. In fact, it shows just how depressing that world is. Key to the film though is Al Pacino's performance as Lefty, the gangster who brings Johnny Depp's undercover FBI agent into his crime family. He plays it weak, suspicious, paranoid, stupid, but also tenderly. It's one of the great performances of his in the 1990s where he didn't just shout most of his lines. Punch of salt. Punch. Punch. Punch of salt. Punch or pinch. Punch. Punch. Not pinch. What did I say? I said pinch. No, you said punch. Sometimes you don't make no fucking sense, Donnie. In a number eight, as good as it gets, featuring one of the last great performances from Jack Nicholson. What do they teach you to talk like this in some Panama City sailor want a hump hump bar, or is this getaway day and your last shot at his whiskey? Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. Here he plays a Scrooge-esque character, a misanthropic, rude writer who suffers from OCD. It's Nicholson at his best. How do you write women so well? I think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability. The character's solitary life, however, is turned upside down when he is forced to care for his neighbor's dog and when he falls in love with a waitress. Helen Hunt is perfectly cast as this struggling waitress. Greg Kinnear is fantastic as his unlucky neighbor and the dog gives possibly the best performance in the film. James L. Brooks writes witty, moving scripts and is tremendous with actors. We can see where this story is going, but it is filled with so many touching moments and hilarious scenes that it totally sweeps you up. Pay me a compliment, Melvin. I need one. And mean it. You make me want to be a better man. In a number seven, Princess Mononoke. Another stunning Studio Ghibli fantasy film. The story follows a young Emishi princess named Ashitaka in medieval Japan. But this is not really a historical film. It blends in fantasy elements to give it a more magical feeling and to help aid the themes of environmentalism. Our protagonist gets involved in a struggle between the princess of the forest and the humans who are destroying it with mechanization for resources. It's a stunning looking, imaginative, epic film with an adult script and adult themes. Mizayaki at his best. In a number six, Starship Troopers. Silly on the surface, but with much more lying underneath. Paul Verhoeven's third sci-fi film after Robocop and Total Recall is such a ride. Many people completely misinterpreted it upon its release, thinking it was just a bloodthirsty fascist film that applauded illegal invasions of countries. The film 100% satirizes fascism. It's actually pretty obvious, especially with the fake recruitment commercials spread throughout the film. 
I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. <laughs> we basically follow a bunch of attractive kids as they take part in an invasion of an alien planet. The melodrama and romance are TV soap opera level, but the action is absolutely astonishing. Terrifying, edgy seat stuff. And of course with Verhoeven, remarkably violent. The CGI of the bugs is surprisingly good and still holds up, mostly. It's a wonderful biting satire, while also being nail-biting stuff. It's a fray! In a number five, Brother or Brat, a brilliant Russian crime film. Shot in the stunning city of St. Petersburg, we follow a very naive young ex-conscript who comes to the city to look for his brother and then gets caught up in the mob. Sergei Bodrov Jr. is superb as the lead, nailing both the innocence and capable nature of the character. He's totally unpredictable, as is the entire movie. It has this remarkable warm cinematography while showing the city to be a freezing, cold, hard place to get by in. It also has some lovely jumpers. The film was a big inspiration to Grand Theft Auto 4, and you can tell. It captures an uncertain time in Russia in a fascinating way. Hey. Cold. Huh. In a number four, Face Off. Should this silly film be this high up on anyone's list? No, no, it shouldn't. The face... I love the Hong Kong films of John Woo. They were OTT, and this is his first Hollywood film where he had creative control, and he certainly used the budget to do what he wanted. When I was putting together this list, I figured that this would get in somewhere, but when I rewatched it, I couldn't believe how bonkers the whole thing was. There almost is in the scene without a bizarre directorial decision or strange choice from the two lead actors. Its premise is ridiculous. Nicolas Cage and John Travolta play a good guy and a bad guy who through new nonsense medical procedures change faces and identities. Bollocks! But Cage and Travolta throw themselves into this and are simultaneously terrible and wonderful. The action of course is terrific and the film builds and builds and manages to get sillier and sillier. For me, this is the best silly film of 1997. <laughs> In a number three, Jackie Brown. One of my personal favorite Tarantino films is also his most restrained. His first film, Reservoir Dogs, was small and contained. Then Pulp Fiction was wilder and bigger, and if, for instance, Kill Bill had been his next film, he may have looked like a director who was losing control. But this adaptation of Elmore Leonard's Rum Punch proved that he could rein in his seemingly uncontrollable energy. This is his slowest, most mature film, and his only adaptation. He takes the source novel by adding loads of references to the exploitation films of the 1970s. He does all this though without it making it seem like a parody. The references aren't too on the nose and it just adds a wonderful cool atmosphere to the proceedings. Pam Greer stars as Jackie Brown, a flight attendant who is caught smuggling money between Mexico and the US. Now she's stuck between the FBI and the arms dealer who hired her. Greer is fantastic in the lead and she's joined by a stellar cast, including Samuel L. Jackson at his best, AK-47, the very best there is. When you absolutely, positively got to kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitutes. Bridget Fonda giving the best performance of her career. Robert De Niro giving one of his best performances. 
That's Japan. Oh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, it looks, I can tell. Wanna fuck? Yeah. Michael Keaton being effortlessly cool and Robert Forster as the heart of the film as a bail bondsman who falls for Jackie Brown. Their romance is a beautiful tale of older people falling for each other. The soundtrack is of course astonishing and there isn't any ultra violence but the few moments of violence are chillingly realistic. Is she dead? I, I, I pretty much. What do you mean, pretty much, Lewis? That ain't no fucking answer. Yes or no? Is she dead? I, I think so. You think so? Tell me, Lewis. She's is dead. she? She's dead. In a number two, Boogie Nights, Paul Thomas Anderson's first masterpiece. This chronicles the rise and fall of a porn star during the golden age of porn in the 1970s into the VHS era of the 1980s as he deals with a fragile ego and plenty of addictions. Mark Wahlberg stars and gives his best performance as the egotistical dim actor. Not a stretch for him, but he is excellent in the film. The ensemble cast is outstanding, with Julianne Moore giving another superb performance, John C. Riley being hilarious as his stupid best friend, Don Cheadle as a porn star who loves country music, William H. Macy being brilliant as a weak cameraman. My fucking wife has an ass in her cock in the driveway, Kurt. All right? I'm sorry if my thoughts are not on the photography of the film we're shooting tomorrow. Heather Graham on top form as Roller Girl, Louis Guzman as great as always, as well as Alfred Molina in a scene-stealing small role, Thomas Jane, Philip Baker Hall, and the master himself, Philip Seymour Hoffman, giving a wonderfully weak performance as a sound man. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to grab you like that or scare you or anything. Right, Do you want to kiss me or? Scotty. No. But playing the godfather of the industry here is Burt Reynolds, giving his very best performance. Anderson is such a wonderful director. He brings together great casts and a great crew. The film looks terrific, with fantastic cinematography, amazing costumes, sets and locations. And of course, it has a magnificent soundtrack. This film has so much life and so much humour. Anderson at his best. Wonderful. Cut. Terrific. Nice oh, work. Right. Nice work. And in a number one, LA Confidential. I used to watch this film so much as a kid. We had it on VHS and I simply loved it. I couldn't bloody follow it, but the atmosphere and recreation of 1950s Hollywood totally hypnotized me. Once I could follow it, I loved it even more and it was a gateway film slash drug into the literary world of James Elroy, one of my favourite authors. He doesn't like the film, but then he's a weird guy. But listen, Granny, you'll love the movie. Did you go out and buy the book? And Granny invariably says, well, oh, I didn't. And I say to Granny, then what the fuck good are you to me? I'll try to use some of his unique language as I talk. As with quite a few of his major novels, we follow three men embroiled in a world of peepers, prowlers, pederasts, panty sniffers, punks and pimps. Three very different cops. We've got Russell Crowe as Bud White, a mostly honourable cop with a burning hatred for wife beaters. Guy Pearce as Ed Exley, an ambitious cop who isn't interested in making friends as he climbs to the top. And Kevin Spacey as Jack Vincennes, a cop who loves the glitz and glamour of Hollywood and cares more about his suits than the people he arrests. All three are simply extraordinary in the picture. And all three characters go through huge transformations. Not as much as in the book, but that has the luxury of being set over nearly a decade. They are joined by some other terrific actors, including James Cromwell, Kim Basinger, and Danny DeVito. Karen, this is Sid Hutchins from Hush Hush Magazine. Hello, Karen. After a massacre at a diner, the three cops discover a massive conspiracy involving the heroin trade and prostitutes who get plastic surgery to look like movie stars. The story is full of twists and turns and completely sucks you in, as does the creation of 1950s Los Angeles. The locations, sets and costumes create a world that doesn't seem like the distant past. It is stylish without being over stylized, such as the terrible adaptation of Elroy's Black Dahlia. The music, the script, the action, I just love it all. LA Confidential will leave you reamed, steamed and dry cleaned, tie-dyed, swept to the side, true blue, tattooed and bafongood. You heard it here first, off the record, 
on the QT and very hush hush. Right, so counting down my top 20. In a number 20, the fifth element. In a number 19, Hannah B. In a number 18, Air Force One. In a number 17, Children of Heaven. In a number 16, Con Air. In a number 15, Happy Together. In a number 14, Men in Black. In a number 13, Gattaca. In a number 12, Gross Point Blank. In a number 11, Good Will Hunting. In a number 10, Perfect Blue. In a number 9, Donnie Brasco. In a number 8, As Good As It Gets. In a number 7, Princess Mononoke. In a number 6, Starship Troopers. In a number 5, Brother. In a number 4, Face Off. In a number 3, Jackie Brown. In a number 2, Boogie Nights. And in a number 1, LA Confidential. Well, those are my top 20 films of 1997. What did I leave out? Loads, probably. So what are your top 20 films of 1997? Cheers.